Today, we'll just look at the passage of Scripture. And I'll ask those who've got Bibles you do, we will turn to Luke chapter 7. And in Luke chapter 7, we have a very interesting story. The Word of God tells us in the second verse, at a time that Jesus walked the earth and there was a man with a problem. And in verse 2 tells us that there was a certain centurion's servant. A centurion in those days was a Roman officer. A one that would have tremendous power, who had not only a power, he had authority to go with it, and, but he had a problem. And his problem, however, was uh, regarding a servant. A servant who was very dear to him, the Bible says, who was sick and ready to die. Wow. And what did this man do? So when he heard about Jesus, he said, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with Jesus to come and heal his servant. And so when the Jews came to Jesus, what did they do? They backed him earnestly. They said that though this man, this centurion, was not one of them, he was very deserving. Why was he deserving? Because they said he loves the nation. He loves Israel, even though he was not a Jew. And he's even built a synagogue. So we see here a man with a heart. A man with a heart that had a problem because he had a servant who was very dear but was sick and dying. So because of the pleading, verse 6 tells that Jesus said, okay, I'll go with you. And the Bible tells us that as Jesus went, he was not far from the house, and all of a sudden the centurion saw Jesus coming. And what did he do? Immediately he sent friends to Jesus saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy you should enter under my roof. You see, this man was also a man of great sensitivities. Why? Because he realized Jesus as a Jewish rabbi would not generally enter into a house of a non-believer. But listen to more. What did he say? Therefore, I do not even think myself worthy to come to you. Because the fact is, he was not a Jewish believer. So he said what? But just say the word and my servant will be healed. Verse 8 tells us, he said this word, For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turned around and said to the crowd that follow him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And verse 10 says, And those who were sent by the centurion, when they returned to the house, they found that the servant who had been sick had already been healed. May the Lord just bless this, His word. And this is a very interesting passage of Scripture. We know that Jesus had the anointing of His life. And the anointing of His life, the Bible tells us, came when he reached the age of 30 years old, when he went to the River Jordan, and as he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Not only came upon him, the Word of God reminds us that he was the first man to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. First man. Because he was without sin. You see, this is a very important fact. One is that the Holy Spirit of God cannot indwell those who are sinners. And after the fall, all of us, whether you've done anything wrong or not, we are being reproduced in sin. That's what the Bible says. But Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit as the first man was created by God without sin. But the first man failed and sin came into the world. But the Bible says Jesus was born without sin because he was conceived by the Spirit of God. And not only born without sin, but he was tested. For 30 years of life, he lived as a normal person on earth. Tested in every way, but yet found without sin. And because of that, the Bible says, 
when he went to be the river to be baptized, the Holy Spirit indwelled him. Amen. And from that moment, he went round, and before that, he did no miracles. But after the indwelling of the Spirit, he went round, miracles followed. And the Bible reminds us that Jesus did so many miracles that there was and would be no books on earth enough to record it. But here we see one of the healings, one of the miracles. And this miracle was different from the rest. In some of the previous miracles, we see Jesus touching. We see Jesus speaking over these people who were sick. Sick people were brought to him. But here, something different. He was on the way to heal the man. But yet, the centurion interrupted everything by sending people to say, don't come. I can understand this. When the authority of God is here, there is no limitation. There is no boundaries. He said, just as I'm in charge of soldiers, I have authority. And he can recognize that when there's spiritual authority, spiritual authority is not limited by time, space, or matter. Amen. And the key word was this, that Jesus said, never have I seen such great faith. And we must look at this word faith. Because you'll find that many times people just got healed because of this faith. Further down, we see another story. As Jesus walking one day to go and pray for a daughter of an, another Jewish noble, along the way, there was a woman. A woman with an issue of blood. A woman who had for 12 years suffered this issue of blood. A bleeding condition that could not stop. And the Bible says, by this time, she was weak. She had spent all her money at doctors without any help. And she had no more money, no more servants, nobody. But when she heard about Jesus, she decided, I'm going to go out to look for Jesus. She didn't wait for Jesus to come to her. And the Word of God tells us that she went out. And in those days, because she had an issue of blood, she was considered unclean. And because she was unclean, she was not supposed to go into groups of people, especially people who may be religious people because he, she would, what, cause them to be contaminated, especially with this sort of blood issue. But she went. And the Bible tells us story. She went on hands and, and feet. She was very weak. But she looked for Jesus. And wow, there was crowds of people. What did they do? She pressed in with only one thing. She said, if I can but touch, just touch that hem of his clothes. That's all. She had a faith to believe, I'll get healed. And the Bible says, when she went on her hands and knees, pushing the crowd, when she touched, immediately, she got healed. Immediately. And all of a sudden, Jesus said this, who touched me? <laughs> now, of course, the disciples said, look at all the crowd around who, who do you know who touched you? But Jesus said, no, this is not a normal touch. It was a touch of somebody who had faith. He said, in fact, these words, I could feel healing power just moved. You see, the healing power is the Holy Spirit of God that's already upon Jesus, in Jesus. And all of a sudden, he could feel power move. Why? Because of a touch, not any touch, but a touch of faith. You know, it took me a long time to understand this. Today, the Bible says, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, your sins may be horrible. But when God looks at you, He doesn't see you as a sinner if you believe in Jesus. Not only that, the Bible of God says, if you believe in Jesus, you're like a new person. The old has passed away. All things have come new. Although your sins were as red as anything else, it's colored. But before God, if you believe, you're no longer a sinner. And the great promise is that as Jesus indwelled the Holy Spirit, as a believer, your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
You're no longer a sinner. And the Spirit of God can indwell you. And the same healing power of God that moved wherever Jesus moved, that even after Jesus died and was ascended into heaven, the Bible says, even the disciples had the same healing power. I want to hear this. The healing power of God is here. I believed it. I prayed with people and people got healed. But I prayed with people, some people didn't get healed. And I've gone for God and I said, God, I don't understand this. I pray with people who are yeah, sometimes new Christians, sometimes people not yet believe. And what happened? They got healed. And I prayed with other Christians who have been Christian for 20 years, faithfully in church, and they never got healed. And God reminded me. You see, the power of God moved, not because God was there. The power of God moved because of this word, faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us, without faith, we cannot please God. Is God not happy with you? Of course He's happy with you. But yet, the Bible says, the moment you believe in Jesus, you're already blessed with all the promise of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. This Bible contains 7,487 promises that when you believe in Jesus, it's yours as a yes and an amen. It's there. Ephesians 1, 3 says, you're already blessed with all these spiritual blessings in Christ. But yet the Bible says, but all these up there in heaven. You see, the promises up there is no use. If you're a believer, you're already entitled to all the promises. But I want you to hear this. It's your faith that reaches out into heavenly dimension. That can touch the very glory and the power of God that can bring the healing of God down here for you. The trouble is, you can be a Christian believing in Jesus for many years, and yet you don't allow faith to rise. Unfortunately, I'm not against doctors, don't get me wrong. But when people fall sick, what do they do? Of course, we are in a society today when technology is so much, medical science is advanced and everything. But I want you to hear this. Doctors in all their knowledge, everything, are not healers. They can help your body healing ability to work. Yes, from beginning, God put healing powers in your body. If you cut your hand, for example, bad cut, you go to the doctor, what happened? The doctor said, okay, clean up the wound, stitch you up. They tell you, go home. You go home, but not heal yet. Right? And the doctor says, your body will heal itself. If you've got cancer, for example, what does the doctor do? He will use chemotherapy, radiotherapy, operation, remove tumor, everything. But what? You know what they actually do? They are trying to remove the tumor, and with chemotherapy and radiography, all those, they will kill all the cells and hope their body will then reproduce good cells without the cancer cells. But doctors don't heal. They are only helping your body healing ability. But the word of God here I'm talking today is not about secular, natural healing. I'm talking about the divine power of God that brings the promise of God into a yes and an amen. And I struggled this for a long time. I couldn't understand until I began this word faith. Now I want you to hear this. This word faith before Jesus came in the Old Testament, you know how many times this word faith appears in the Bible? Mm. Old Christians, how many times does the word faith appear in the Bible before Jesus came? Old Testament. You'd be surprised. I tell you, when God spoke this to me, I couldn't believe it. I went and checked it out. Do you know in the King James Version, it only appears twice? Only twice. And in fact, when I looked at the Hebrew word, that word faith should be more correctly translated as faithfulness. 
It's all about their faithfulness to believe in what God asked them to do. Set of rules, commandments, laws. Ten commandments that became what? 900 Levitical laws. Hmm. That became tons and tons of rabbinic writings by those teachers trying to understand. God, I want to tell you this. They didn't get healed by law. They still needed the power of God. And it's actually the New Testament for the first time after Jesus came, the word faith is used 268 times. Not only used 268 times, you see every time that people reach out and the word is faith, the power of God moved. I want to tell you this. If you need finances, amen, you can work hard Use the talents God has given you. You can make money. But if you come to me and say, brother, help me. Sorry, I can't reproduce finances for you. If you are going through problems in financial area, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I can give you some money to help you pass the day. But I tell you, it's God that can bring a miracle even to break you free. I'm serious. I prayed for people who are going through financial issues, people going through bankruptcies, and I tell you this, God can make a way to set you free. I don't have time to tell my whole story. I also went through all the financial issues. I want to tell you this, I've seen people come with all sorts of sickness. I don't have the power to heal. I know when I go to places like India, everybody will just touch you. <laughs> Sometimes I follow the Bible and say, use anointing oil. You know, they all come and they bring their pots of oil and say, can you pray for the oil? Give me a bit of oil. But there's no power in the oil. I'll tell you something. But there is faith. When I use this because the Word of God tells me that I can use this to bring the presence of God into people's body. And what's the faith? I'm just faith in the Word of God. <laughs> there's no power in oil. It's only symbolic of the anointing of God's Holy Spirit coming upon people. But when I use it, I'm using it in faith. Somebody say, Amen. <laughs> so, if you touch me, you touch Him in. I also need a healing. Amen. <laughs> but I tell you this, I know the power of God. And I'm not talking about coming to you and say, okay, brother, I want to pray for you. And I tell you this, you must go eat this vitamin, eat this vitamin, eat this. That is not divine healing. Divine healing is when we lay hands and we're going to believe the power of God heals. Who had a woman that came here? All the way from Myanmar. Came with her husband. Husband's a pastor. And she was in the final stage of cancer. Doctors couldn't help her anymore. Somebody sponsored her and her husband to come to Singapore to go and see a doctor. Doctors told her the same thing. There's nothing more we can do. They're in the final stage. And finally she came here. The husband had to practically carry her up because she had actually uh, cancer in the stomach area and everything. And she's not been able, intestinal, couldn't eat everything. And she, for a few months, everything she eats, throw up, and she was nothing but skin and bones. She was carried up here. I prayed for her. And God touched her. She went down. So if you go to our website, you see the actual story recorded. She came back to give a testimony. She went down. And after, when she got up, she told her husband, I'm healed. Husband said, you're healed? She said, yes. When I was on the floor, I felt a hand go into my stomach. I can touch her. <laughs> so God, but it was her faith. And when she got up, you know, she said, she told her husband, I'm healed now. When they were leaving, she started to walk fast. Husband said, no, no, don't strain yourself. You know what she said to her husband? No. I'm healed. I must walk. When she left this place, she told her husband, I'm hungry, can eat. Husband said, you cannot eat this type of food. She said, no, I'm healed. I must eat. You see, that's her faith to believe that God had touched her. Yes, she felt a touch of God, no doubt. But she could say, Ayo, you don't know who can touch me when I'm down. I am still sick. Do you know if her faith was, I'm still sick, guess what? The cancer will stay on her. But it was a faith to be able to say, I believe I'm healed. 
And that was on a Saturday night. And her test screen Wednesday, when they went back to see a doctor, the doctor was surprised. Tumor marker was down. Doctor couldn't believe it. A scan couldn't find a single tumor. Amen. I remember another lady that came. She actually went to the church that Reverend Wilfred was pastoring many years ago. She was in a final stage of cancer too. She had 20 tumors. I didn't know that. 20 tumors in a womb. From Australia, she came. She had migrated there. And her brother was a doctor, said, you better come back because the Australian doctors all said, you've got no more help. We, we cannot do anything for you. You are in the final stage. When you come here, the doctor said the same thing. We can give some chemo and maybe prolong your life, but you've got so many tumors, there's nothing we can do. Finally, she went out of desperation to a healing service. I was preaching there. And I tell you this, I didn't know what I was saying. She, they reminded me of this. When she came out, I asked her one question. Where's your cancer? And before she could answer, I felt the Lord ask me another question. And I said to her, I don't see cancer anymore. Cancer no more. I see children. And you know what she said? When she heard that, she said, this pastor, Tampo, I'm dying. And you're going to tell me, see children? Well, I'll tell you something. But yet, she began to believe in God to do it. And doctors surprised with a short time, she got healed. 20 tumors without operation disappeared. Only the doctor said to her, look, your womb is in such a bad condition, you can never conceive. All the ovaries are destroyed. You know what she said? Thank you. Happy. I got life at least to go back to Australia. But one day, she was in a healing service. I mean, in a normal service. And there was a man that was preaching about how God wants us to be fruitful, to multiply, to bless us. Not me, another man there. And she told her husband, all of a sudden she remembered, hey, the pastor last time said children. Huh? And they went out for prayer. In that month, she was pregnant. I wasn't even there. But you know what happened? After the first child, when they contacted me, do you know they believe God for more children? And I so happened to go to Australia and they came bringing the child for me and everything. And then all of a sudden, she opened up and came. Pastor, you say children. Second one. <laughs> I want to tell you this. Her name is Kat Noy. You can see the test on our website. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, even above all we can ask or imagine. It's not me. Amen. God, power is here to heal. But it's your faith that will touch the power of God. If your faith is in me, I wouldn't say wrong source of faith. So let's try to understand this word faith now. 268 times mentioned in the New Testament. And not only that, the faith is now defined for us in the New Testament. In the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews chapter 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, yet the evidence of things not seen. Now, if you will listen to this, I tell you this is totally contradiction. Faith is the substance. The word substance in Greek is hutatasis. Hutatasis means it's something that's so solid, something you can hold on, something you can believe, something you can see. Faith is a substance of hope. But yet, you cannot see contradictions. Faith is based on a hope. I want to tell you something. There's different types of hope. There's a human hope. How many of you all got human hope? Our human hope is based on our own desires. I got ladies come. Pastor, pray for me. I need a husband. And that's a good hope. But what is God saying to you? Amen. I've seen miracles. Yes. Jonathan is here. I, saw, I spoke to him just now. Wave to me, Jonathan. I tell you this. Jonathan, I first knew him, was 20 years ago. Amen. Young couple. Wife had cervical cancer. Correct? And doctors did everything. 
He went to remission and he came back. And even worse, they were talking all sorts of treatment, but a friend brought her to one of the meetings I had in the house. We prayed for her and only word, this is the thing, you see, where is your hope based on? And there was a word of faith I gave to her. And that word of faith was in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, say the Lord. And they're plans of good and not evil, plans to give hope in the future. And she believed in that word. She began to trust God. She began to attend the meeting to hear more. To bring, you see, we have got ideas here. But faith is not hate knowledge. Faith wants to come to your heart where faith begins for you to believe. But faith wants to come right in here. Right in here. I tell you, when faith comes right here, you know what? No more arguments. It's like, if I come to Yvonne here, I say, Yvonne, are you saved? She said, yes, I'm safe. How do you know you're safe? He said, oh, because I believe in Jesus. But how do you know you believe in Jesus? I say, because the word of God tells me, and I can keep challenging her. And I keep challenging her until one point she may say, hey, don't talk anymore. La. Why? I know because I know. You see, the faith goes from an intellectual understanding into heart, you believe something, but right here when there's a conviction and nobody shakes your conviction. You see, the human hope can always be shaken. The Bible tells us there was a man called Abraham. He believed in God. He was 75 years old. One be father, Lao Liao, no children. Heard God, follow God. Wow, 100 years old, still, the Bible says, no more hope. Why? He looked at himself, body, I'm 100 years old already. Look at the wife, womb. Monopostle, dead. No more human hope. But he still had a godly hope. A godly hope because he believed God told him, you follow me, I'll bless you. He did a lot of funny things. He even took the wife's maid to have a child. And God said, no, 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 no. It's going to be from your wife. Look at wife. God, dry up already. But you see, God is not a man that he should lie. Not a son or man that he should say sorry or repent. When God says it, he's going to do it. Yes. When God gives you a word, he's the one who make it good. That's what the Bible says. You see, our faith is important must be based on the substance. Who is the substance? Who is God to you? Abraham, the Bible said, after 25 years, he now believed his God. His God is so great that the God can what? Even give life to them. Romans chapter 4, verse 17 says, and the God who called the things which be not as though they were. Translate Chinese, huh? That's the type of God. Even though it's not there, God said it means definitely will happen. But have you heard from God? Are you hearing her desires? You see, these are things we've got to work out. Even you hear from God. It took Abraham some time to work it out. And the Bible says, do you know he did not lose the promise to unbelief? I want to hear this. Many of us are believers, believing in God, and yet we can lose the promise of God through unbelief. You see, if you don't believe in God, there's disbelief. But you can believe in God and be a believer and yet have unbelief. You know what's the key of the unbelief? You cannot see, but do you believe God? Because who is God to you? Many ask, oh yeah, I waited too long, cannot work already. Many times, then we think God needs help. Jonathan, come back to the story. Do you know after the cancer got healed, without operation, nothing? Doctors said the womb was too weak and everything and wanted to give them all sorts of treatment, IVF or something, right? But you know, her faith was on the word of God, Jeremiah 29, 11. You have good plans for me. And she believed God and she refused to go for IVF, nothing. And when God says cannot, she got a pair of twins. Are the twins here? Amen. Why do you both come? Stand up, come, come, front. 
I won't tell you this. Come, 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 come up here. I ask them to come because they are testimony. When doctors say cannot, amen. You know how old they are now today? Huh? Amen. Not yet eligible to be married yet. <laughs> but no, they are 17, right? Amen. I'll tell you, this is real product. Amen, thank you so much, both of you. And I want to tell you this. But she trusted God for more children. She's got four now. Amen. And the fourth one is the son. I tell you, it was funny. I was talking to Jonathan. Jonathan, don't mind I share this part. Huh? And I said, what do you want next? Anything, lah. God give, okay. I said, no, be specific asking. That one girl. I was talking about the fourth one, right? And I say, be specific. You want a son, right? Talk to God about a son. That's where faith must arise. Guess what? Fourth one was a son. And guess what? They call the name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Important is not about whether it's impossible with men. The Bible says when things are impossible with men, all things are possible with God. Amen. God is not limited. He is only limited by our unbelief. You know, it took Abraham 25 years and the Bible says why. Why was unbelief gone? Because now he is fully persuaded that God who has promised is able to do what he has promised. Have we worked it out yet? Have we been fully persuaded yet? Did you hear the word of faith and have your faith arise to be fully persuaded? Many of us, not. That's why the Bible tells us, faith, where does faith come from? Peter tell me, oh pastor, but you got more faith than I. No. The Bible says, God has given you a measure of faith for whatever situation you need. God has given it to you already. But we've got to learn to exercise faith. And the Bible actually reminds us, let me quote this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. You see, there's a fight of faith we still need to fight. And the word the Bible says good fight means there can be a bad fight of faith. Amen. Many of us can we just because of our desire, we can believe, 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 believe until you don't know what to believe anymore. But I tell you this: spend time, get in the presence of God. Wherever there's meeting like this, God is here. What is the word of God telling you? Where is your faith on? Is it a faith on here, this man? If your faith is this man, you're going to get disappointed. Say amen, amen. <laughs> but your faith is on God. You see, that's why Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is about a relationship with God. It's only in a relationship that you can hear. Amen. And I want you to hear this. God sent His Son to die for you. Fight the good fight of faith. What is it? Lay hold of eternal life. You know what's eternal life? The Bible defined it. Jesus said it. This is life eternal. John 17, 3. That you might know God as the one true God and Jesus Christ whom He sent. And the word know, actually is root word, if you go back to the Hebrew word, the word yada. Yada is not here, Knowledge. We can read the Bible, we can know. Yada is talking about knowing in a relationship. Knowing until is like, lawyers we call it, consensus at idiom. Two minds come together. Knowing until, like what Adam said, Adam knew his wife. The word is yada. You know, Adam defined it. For this reason, man will not only leave the father and mother, but will cleave to wife, build together. Union of flesh, they shall be one. You see, yada is where you come into that relationship with God. God doesn't hide things from you. In fact, the Bible says, you can have an unction from God. You can know all things. You can have that presence of God come. God can tell you all things. Why are you spending time building relationship with God? Oh, pastor, I do. Like, every morning I pray. I will take a balance with a lot of people. 
Do you spend more time watching TV or spending time with God? I'll challenge you. Today, I posted something on Facebook. One of the biggest distractions is Facebook. You know you got addiction to Facebook every time you've got to open Facebook first. When you get up morning, what do you open first? Your Bible or your Facebook? Oh, you be honest. Today is social media, everything, right? How many times do you open your Facebook in one day? How many times do you open your Bible in one day? I mean, it gives you a balance as to what's your priority. How many times do you switch on the TV compared to the time you just be still before God? I mean, this is something... I'm not here to ask for hands to be raised. Amen? There's something to ask yourself. Have I set God as the author and finisher of my faith? Have I come to a point of my faith to say, God, I know this. Only in you alone can I live, can I move, and have my being. I tell you, when you reach a point, you can then declare, I can do all things to Christ that strengthened me. But it's not by your strength. It's not by your might. It's by the Spirit of God. No? And I want you to hear this tonight. With faith, nothing's impossible. Don't look at man. Don't look at your desire. Ask God, what is your plan for my life? You know, we had a lady to come. No mention names. And she had two boyfriends. One very handsome, good looking. She liked this boy. But this boy, a bit unfaithful. Always hurt her because got a lot of other girlfriends. Now, she had another boyfriend from school days. Friend, always following her around. Even when she's sick, the other boy don't care when. This one, get um, his mother cook food, bring food for her. <laughs> but she had known, what do you say? <laughs> because, and actually, one day my wife had to sit down her and say, hey, why don't you really open your eyes? This one's so good. You're more interested. This one's good looking, good thing, but always break your heart. And you know, she finally gave a chance to that one. And today they're married. I think it's three or four kids now. Happily married, everything. But you see, what is the focus of what you want? Is it your heart's desire? Have you got your terms and conditions? Oh, I know. I, people can't talk to me. Pastor, pray for me. Huh? I want a wife. But she must be like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. Oh. Where's your faith? On your desire. What is God saying to you? No, I don't want to hear from God. Sometimes God brings me the wrong type woman. You see, I tell you something. Sometimes we're too caught with the outward things. Right? Beauty is the eye of the beholder. But when you get married to a woman, after 30 years, beauty also gone. <laughs> but I tell you this. If you marry the right woman, it's not about physical beauty. God knows your heart. As I told all my daughters, you all pray that God will give you a man that will love God more than he loves you. If he loves God more than he loves you, he will never disappoint you. I say amen to that. So I want to tell you this. What is God saying to you in your need? Whether it's for finances, whether it's for the child, whether it's for marriage, whether it's for restoration. I want you to remember something. When you have the giver, you have the gifts. When you have the healer, you have your healing. Psalm 23 says, When the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. Is he object of faith? Is he the author and finisher of faith? Or is it on your desires? Whether it's for healing. I'm not against doctors. Unfortunately though, Many people only look for Jesus when doctors say, cannot help you, you got to die. Amen. I had the same problem too. When I had an attack too, I had to fight the good fight of faith. Because doctors gave me all that. Until doctors scared me so much. Open heart surgery, triple bypass. 
Sometimes we don't wake up and then begin to seek for God. And God was able to heal me. No operations, nothing. Your God and my God is still the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. The inconsistency is not God. It's our faith. You cannot see it. But are you fully persuaded? Let's grab our hearts today. It all begins when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. I want you to hear this again. The key word is never just do you believe in Jesus. He can be the Saviour of your soul, but yet not Lord of your life. The Bible says, is He the Lord of your life? The Bible does not say to as many as believe Him only. John 1, 12 says to as many as received Him into your life so that you can surrender your life to Him. Yes, Lordship requires the word surrender. Have you surrendered your desires, your vision, your ambitions, your everything and say, God, I trust in you right now. To as many as received Him, to them gave He the right to become sons of God. And it includes daughters as well. If you understand who you are, as a child of the mighty God. In Christ, all these 7,487 promises is already a yes and an amen. But your faith needs to rise. Your faith needs to touch the source who gives you the faith. Is he able to do it? Amen. Amen. I want to tell you something. I had a lady that came to me. Pastor, I've been trusting God. Nah. And then God interestingly told me something. I said, if you trust God, why you go to all the SDU meetings? Because she believes you've got to ask God to help her along. <laughs> Amen. I'm not saying you sit in your house and God bring a man to knock on your door. Huh? But sometimes, I say, why don't you spend more time going to church instead? And ask God the right church. Huh? You go to all the wrong church. Some people go to wrong church for wrong reasons. Huh? And you meet all the wrong people there. Somebody say amen. God has a plan. It's of good and not evil. And to give you hope and a future. Amen. But it begins when you say, Lord, I want to accept you as Lord of my life. I not only believe in you right now, but I want to surrender everything to you. My hopes, my visions, my ambitions, I want to surrender to you. My desires, amen. I all, got, all of us got desires. But when your desires are surrendered to God, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, even above all that you can ask and imagine. Ephesians 3.20, but it's going to the power that worketh in you right now. There's a power of your choice. There's a power of your faith. Amen. I want to ask this question right now. Is there anyone here right now? Before I start to pray. Is there anyone here that you may have sat in the church even for years, you may say, I believe in Jesus. But tonight you feel a conviction, God, I don't just want to believe in you. I want to really surrender my life to you. I really want to bring all my desires, everything in line. I want to live the life that you want me to live. Do you know what God is saying to me? Some of you here, you may believe in God, but yet you want to live the life your way. I just counseled somebody only recently. I believe in God, but I cannot stand my husband. Therefore, I want to divorce him. Why do you want to divorce him? Because he's not a believer. Hello? Is that a good reason? No. Has he committed adultery? No. Has he? No. But now I'm a believer. I cannot stay with him because he's a non-believer. That's not a good reason for divorce, is it? But you know why? Later I probe more, I realized. Because she had another person in mind. 
not interested in working out with the husband. I want to tell you this. I sense somebody here has the same struggle. The struggle to want to be faithful to what God asks you to do, and the struggle with all the different desires that are in front of you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I want to say this again. I don't care about how long you believe in Jesus, how long you're in church. Have you asked him not only to be your saviour, but to be your Lord and saviour? Have you said, God, I want to surrender everything to you right now? I know I cannot, only you can. If that's your desire tonight, I want to pray with you first. That's the important key. That's the key that unlocks the power of God and the power of the kingdom of God for you. Your choice. Your faith. Is there anybody here? You are, just wave your hand. The rest all bow your heads right now. I see your hand, brother. Amen. Anybody else here right now? This is between you and God. Hallelujah. Yes, I see the hand there. I see the hand here. Hallelujah. Some of you may be doing this for the first time. Never mind. God is here. Anybody else right now? Okay, for those who raise their hand, I want you to take a step of faith. I want you to come here because I want you right here to pray with you. 